بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام الأتمان الأكملان على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أجمعين أما بعد uh, Just before Salah we stop with the hadith of Umm Habiba, Umm Al-Mu'mineen رضي الله تعالى عنها and we took the generic meaning or what the what the discussion was about that occurred between her and the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in this discussion regarding marriage. To recap some of that, we said that Umm um Habiba is one of the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and one of the mothers of the believers Radiallahu Ta'ala Anha. And that the reason why she was asking this particular question to begin with, number one was what? Was because she had come to know or she had heard of a rumor that the Prophet ﷺ wanted to remarry. And so she wanted to have a say in who the Prophet ﷺ was going to remarry. And so she suggested her sister. We said that we discussed the categories of those that are prohibited or you are prohibited from marrying. And that includes... The statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and tajma'u bain al ukhtaini illa ma qad salaf that you combine between two sisters, two women that are sisters to one another, and that this is from the types of women that you are prohibited from marrying. Now, why would Umm Habiba think that the Prophet was permitted to do this? Why would she suggest this if this ayah was already set down? That is a discussion that some of the scholars of hadith have. And uh, uh, from the responses that was suggested, from the answers to that that was suggested, is that she had thought that this, or the types of uh, uh, marriage that are prohibited for us, the types of women that we are not allowed to marry, that the Prophet ﷺ was exempt from that. And we know that the Prophet ﷺ was exempt from some of that which we took because the Prophet ﷺ married more than how many women? The four that the rest of the believers have to maintain. You can't go above four. Um, and because she had heard that the Prophet ﷺ might be marrying his stepdaughter, which was the daughter of uh, Umm Salama, uh, Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha, she had heard that the Prophet ﷺ was going to marry her, which was wrong anyway. But she had made that analogy, that qiyas, that if the Prophet ﷺ was going to get married to her, and she is from the categories of women that we are not allowed to marry, then that this discussion does not involve the Prophet ﷺ, and she, she came to the Prophet ﷺ and suggested her sister, because she thought that this was something that was permissible from the Prophet ﷺ for the Prophet ﷺ, and so it would be from the types of ruling that are considered from khususiyat, uh, of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Meaning things that were specific to the Prophet Sallallahu And unique to him uh, That the rest of the Ummah does not compare Or we're not allowed to engage in these sort of matters And we're going to come across other examples like that As we go through the chapter of marriage and, and divorce From the rulings that we take away from this hadith Is number one That it is impermissible to marry the sister of your wife, and that such a nikah is invalid. We take away from this hadith that it is impermissible to marry your stepdaughter, and that there is a condition for that impermissibility and invalidity of such a contract or such a marriage, and that is that we actually that the individual actually consummates the marriage, that consummates the marriage, and that there is an intimacy that takes place between him and her mother. Why we have that condition, we're going to talk about inshaAllah ta'ala because we spoke about the fact that the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the duhul, the entering upon them. And the view of some of the scholars of Islam is that if you enter upon them in seclusion, in khalwa, where you and her are alone, even if nothing happens, then that's it. You can't marry her daughter and the rest of the rulings associated with this. Um, and we're going to discuss why that is incorrect, inshaAllah ta'ala, in a hadith that is to come. We, just, we mentioned that, fi hujurikum, that the, your stepdaughters that were raised in your own houses, 
It's not the literal meaning that is sought, but it is uh, an expression of the gravity of what it means to marry a stepdaughter and that how you as a Muslim should feel towards her and look towards her. And so you find that the scholars of Islam mentioned that Al-Qasdu minha at-tabshi'u wa tanfir That this is uh, a phrase that was used to, to almost like push you away from marrying this category of women. Why? Because your viewpoint towards her and how you should feel towards her is the same as how you would view your own daughters. We took away from this hadith the prohibition of marrying um, the daughter of your brother by way of breastfeeding, min al rada'ah. And so she would be your niece by way of uh, al rada'ah, the breastfeeding. And that this is also something that is prohibited. And as a result of that as well, the nikah would become invalid. It would become invalid. From the things that we take away from this hadith is the importance of teaching, especially those that are around us and that you have these frequent discussions with. And so Ummi Habiba, she narrated this hadith to us that contains all of these tremendous benefits because the Prophet wasallam was one that wasn't just a teacher towards the, his ummah, but he would also focus on his family. And this is something that we, as we look at this hadith, that we need to remind ourselves, especially in this chapter of marriage. Marriage is not just a relationship where you get to enjoy one another. It's also about growth and learning with one another. And so look at the conversation that occurred between Ummi Habiba and the Prophet wasallam, and how much fiqh we derived from that. All of these rulings we took away from this uh, conversation. We take away that there is a category of rulings that are specific to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But these rulings that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, that uh, Ummi Habib had assumed were from the categories of knowledge that are rulings that are specific to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam were not from amongst them. But there is, in essence, that category uh, does exist and we take that away um, from this hadith as well. In this hadith and in the hadith that come as well, we also take away the mannerisms or the approach that a Muslim needs to have if he seeks polygamy. So you want to remarry. It's not just about, you know, you've got one wife here, travel to the other hemisphere and find a sister there and almost like do things haphazardly, get married here. One doesn't know about the other. No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made you a man and you have that qawama. And so you need to approach it in this sensible manner whereby there is this conversation and we should not ignore this as we look at this hadith where there, there is a conversation between the Prophet Sallallahu and Umm Habiba regarding who should he should remarry. And so this whole thing about remarrying in secret in a way is not the example that we should follow. And here we have a role model, the Prophet Sallallahu and how he approached this particular matter. The following hadith is the hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala an. We're again in what chapter? What are we talking about? al uh, muharramatu bin al-nikah. So uh, um, we said that this question is revolving around who you are not allowed to marry. An Abi Hurairah radiyallahu anhu qal, qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, la yujma'u bayna al-mar'ati wa ammatiha, wa la bayna al-mar'ati wa khalatiha. And so in this hadith, Abu Hurairah radiyallahu ta'ala anhu narrates that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, la yujma'u, that you do not combine, you do not combine between bayna al-mar'ati wa ammatiha, between a woman Meaning that woman that you are married to. Al-Mar'a here is a zawja, the woman that you are married to, and wa'ammatiha, and her paternal aunt. So the sister of her father. Wala bayna al-mar'ati wa khalatiha. Nor do you combine between a woman, meaning again a woman that you are married to, wa khalatiha, and her maternal aunt, meaning the sister of her mother. So if a woman you are married to has an aunt, which is a sister of a father or a sister of a mother, then that would prohibit the second one, which is marrying her, her aunt from either side. And so here in this hadith, we again take away that the Sharia, when it permitted for us uh, uh, polygamy and remarrying, and that the Muslim seeks multiple wives, it wasn't left to just do that in whatever manner suits you. But you have to seek what is 
correcting that because certain relationships combining between certain types of women leads to harm. And so here it is it's as if we're being told that look out because if you were to marry between a, a woman and her aunt, this would create some sort of ill will and, and envy and anger between them because of them being married to the same man. And so from the types of marriages that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made impermissible is this combination. It is important to know as well that this combination did not come in which ayah? We said the basis of who you cannot marry is what verse? And so this ayah did not come, or this particular circumstance did not come in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so it's as if the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Remember we said everything besides that is permissible for you, it's halal for you. This is تَخْصِيصٌ لِهَذَا العام. This is a specific circumstance that been made exempt from that general principle. So we covered all those categories that occurred in the ayah. And then the Prophet ﷺ included another which is this hadith, this hadith. Um, this is a circumstance, again, there is no dispute regarding the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ is quite clear. And many of the scholars of Islam mentioned the unanimous opinion uh, regarding that. And um, like we said, it is something that you should add on to the categories that we included before, and I think we may have mentioned it anyway. We're going to move on to the next topic, inshallah ta'ala. And the next topic will be regarding ash-shurutu fi nikah. So now you've determined who you are going to marry. So we said the question of who should you marry is not how we view things Islamically, because you're allowed to marry everybody and anybody, except for illa man istuthni. Except for the exceptions that came, we mentioned about 30 odd women that the Sharia states that you cannot marry these types of women. So you've now landed on a sister that you are going to marry. The sister that you are going to marry. We move on to this topic of conditions in a nikah. Conditions in a nikah. And the author, rahimahullah ta'ala, mentioned several ahadith that pertain to uh, this topic. Conditions in a nikah. We have to view it from a number of lenses. There is the lens of conditions that the Sharia comes with. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us with things that are conditions within the marital contract. And the Prophet sallallahu conveyed unto us matters that are from the conditions of a marital contract. We're going to see a few examples of that inshaAllah ta'ala, such as for example, Rida al zawjain Rida al-Zawjain, which is the volition and the free will of both spouses. So the, the, the groom here is not forced and the bride isn't forced as well. They opted to marry this individual. You have other such conditions such as the mahar, the dowry for example, and that the woman is not prevented from that. And we'll talk about that inshallah ta'ala, but the meaning isn't, like for example, you may not state the exact amount that you're going to give her. But to completely remove that and to say there is no dowry here, there is no maha here, there is no actual valuable thing that she's going to receive in exchange for that, then that is a, a prohibition that we'll see and look at inshallah ta'ala, and that is part of this topic of conditions to do with marriage. We can categorize the conditions of marriage also in two different ways, which are conditions that the Sharia brings about. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stated conditions, shurut, that by way of them, by way of them being present, the nikah is valid and correct. And there are conditions that we stipulate. And we look at that as well, inshaAllah ta'ala, where for example, the bride or the groom, they say, I'm happy to get married to you, but my condition is X. My condition, my condition is Y. My condition is Z. And these conditions that they stipulate from their own self, they're, they're not based on the Quran and Sunnah. These are conditions that they are putting onto the table. We can categorize those conditions into two categories. There is a portion of them that are 
valid, meaning they are accepted and we need to uphold. And that is what the first hadith is going to be about. And there's a portion of them that are invalid. They're rejected automatically. How do we determine what is valid and what's invalid from these conditions? The scholars of Islam have much discussion regarding this from, but from the best way of viewing the, this topic essentially. So this is the basic principle of what conditions are accepted and what conditions are rejected is مَا لَا يُخَالِفُ مُقْتَضَى الْعَقْدِ وَمَا هُوَ مُخَالِفٌ لِمُقْتَضَى الْعَقْدِ What does this mean? This means that the conditions that are accepted are ones that do not oppose what the marital contract is about and was legislated for, essentially. And so, for example, if there was somebody to stipulate a condition where you, you, you're, I'm going to marry you, for example, but with the condition that there is no intimacy, that goes against the very nature of what this marriage is about. So that automatically is, is an invalid condition. As for the valid condition, that, and that is in essence everything that does not oppose what the marital con contract is there to uphold anyway. And we discuss some of the wisdoms and purposes, maqasid, of aqdun nikah. Valid condition and valid. Valid condition? No, in the condition itself. A shot nafsaha. Invalid. Invalid. The, the, no, tabtul bas is shot. The condition itself is just going to end up valid, invalid or valid without looking. With the marriage itself, then it will continue on. But you just say this condition is not to be upheld because that condition opposes the contract itself. It's almost like it's contradicting itself. There is a tanaqub between the shar and the aqd. In essence, before we actually start this, the Muslims, as Muslims, we are commanded to uphold conditions that we stipulate amongst ourselves and we accept. The Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith, Al-Muslimuna ala shurutihim. That Muslims are upon their conditions and they act by them. Illa shartan harrama halalan aw ahalla haraman. Except for conditions that permit that which is impermissible or make permissible or make impermissible that which is permissible. And so as long as that's not there, then we have to uphold whatever conditions that we agree to. And so the author, rahimahullah ta'ala, starts us off with the first hadith, which is the hadith of Uqbah ibn Amir. An Uqbah ibn Amir in qal, qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, inna ahaqqa al-shuroot an tuwuffu bihi mastahlaltum bihi al-furuj. That the most deserving of conditions that are stipulated in any contract is that which leads to the permitting of intimacy. That which leads to the permitting of intimacy. And we said that the permitting of intimacy is what contract? Aqdun nikah. Aqdun nikah. And so it's here the Prophet wasallam is saying that the most important of conditions are the conditions that are stipulated from amongst all of these different contracts is the conditions that are stipulated in a marital contract. That are stipulated in a marital uh, contract. And we're going to see some of what that includes, inshallah ta'ala. And so we take away from this hadith the greatness of this marital contract and the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala azama sha'naha. He informs us in verses as well as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his sunnah about the greatness of this marital contract and how important it is for us to upkeep its rights and its conditions and so on. And so you have the marital contract itself and then you have conditions that are stipulated within that marital contract and they similarly become important because of what it is attached to, which is the marital contract which holds this great weight in the Sharia. We take away from this hadith the obligation the obligation of carrying out whatever conditions were stipulated within the marital contract that you agreed to. This could, this could mean things like uh, a certain amount of mahar. This could be specifying a certain place you're going to live in. This could be 
for example, from the man's side that you stipulate that she's a virgin or this or that, all of that are conditions that have to be upheld because you stipulated so within that contract. Everything that is attached to the marital contract that does not oppose it has to be upheld and it is the most deserving of what must be upheld. The Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ did not leave this in that manner where it was left generic. And because of that you find, and this hadith, we, also, we almost need to view it as the generic sort of principle with regards to this chapter. Any condition, whether that is a condition that we find by way of the Qur'an and the Sunnah, or that we stipulate, they must be upheld. And then you find categories of conditions that were made impermissible. A good example of that, and this is a whole category of a hadith that come regarding this. The Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith, لا يحل لمرأة تسأل عن طلاق أختها That they, it's not permissible for a woman, for a woman to ask and stipulate within a marital contract that her co-wife or a future co-wife is then divorced. So she says, for example, I'm happy to marry you. But with a condition that you divorce that other woman. That's not allowed for you. And so this is a type of condition that becomes wrong and incorrect and invalid and must be avoided. And al hadith fi had al bab kathira, you find a number of a hadith that stipulate types of things that the sharia said, you know what, this is invalid, this is not correct, and there are reasons uh, for that. We take away from this hadith that. The conditions of a nikah, they are in exchange for what? Mahar? No. The conditions of a nikah, more specifically mahar, they come in in exchange for what? The Prophet said in the hadith, uh, uh, That the most deserving of conditions that are stipulated, in a contract, or that which leads to the permitting of intimacy. And so the conditions in this contract, from the man's side, they are in exchange for intimacy. And so we're going to move on, inshallah ta'ala, to the most important of those conditions, which is the mahar, and uh, the importance of paying the mahar, because of that exchange that it, that it comes in with regards to the sharia. Because it comes in exchange for that permitting of intimacy. Uh, before we move on from this hadith, I want to quite quickly point out something very important. The matter of a lot of things in life, the sharia takes back to what we know as al-urf, which are the social sort of norms and customs. And so here, for example, Shaykh al-Islam Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala says, وَالصَّحِيحُ أَلَّذِي عَلَيْهِ أَكْثَرُ السَّلَفِ أَنَّ مَا يُوجِبُ الْعَقْدِ لِكُلِّ وَاحِدٍ مِّنَ الزَّوْجَيْنِ عَلَى الْآخَرِ كَالنَّفَقَةِ وَالْإِسْتِمْتَاعِ وَالْمَبِيتِ لِلْمَرْأَةِ وَكَالْإِسْتِمْتَاعِ لِلزَّوْجِ لَيْسَ بِمُقَدَّرِ بَلِ الْمَرْجِعُ فِي ذَلِكَ إِلَى الْعُرْفِ So he says, rahimahullah ta'ala, that which the majority of the earliest generations of Muslims were upon is that that which the marital contract entails. And so these are almost like things that attach onto the marital contract. Such as nafaqa, which we said are the financial needs of the woman. al istimta, which is the intimacy as well, and how often or not it may occur. Al-Mabit, where she's going to live and so on. All of these matters, where do we take them back to? What is the standard? How much of it is, is required and how, how much is not required? All of that he says that the majority of the ummah from the earliest generations of Muslims, they considered that the muqaddar, its degree is taken from al-urf, which are the social norms. There is a social norm here in Kuwait. There is a social norm somewhere else in another part of the world. Whatever that norm is in the society that you live in, and this is the issue of customs. Al-urf ma'mulun bihi idha warad. That the urf is one of the principles of the Sharia. And so it takes us back to that issue of the norms of society, the society that you live in. What is the standard there? And so where do the top where does this topic of conditions fit in? The Shaykh Rahimallah Ta'ala he explains that 
the conditions then then latch on to this standard by way of the woman or the man coming along and saying, well, yes, this is left to the norm of society, but I want this. And so them stipulating what they want individually, which is their perspective, then becomes a shart, a condition that they stipulated instead of it being the social standard and the social norm that they would have acted upon otherwise. Does that make sense? And we're going to see examples of that as we go through inshallah ta'ala because this is very important for you to understand. And a good example of that we'll get to inshallah ta'ala shortly such as the topic of mahar. The mahar as we'll see in the, the following hadith which is literally about nikah al-shigar it needs to be there as a condition for the validity of nikah. But the fact that you specify a specific amount and you say I'm going to pay this much is not required. Because even if you don't stipulate a certain amount, you would go back to Mahr al-Mithil, which is the dowry of the norms of the society you live in. And so how much does the average person from amongst her family members, the society they live in, how much would they receive? And she would be given that much, even if you didn't agree. But had you agreed to a certain amount, it would then become a condition that you give them that amount. Is that clear? We're going to move on to the following hadith and it talks about one of the conditions of marriage insha'Allah ta'ala and we'll see that uh, quite clearly. And Abdullah ibn Umar radiyallahu anhuma anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam anaha an nikah al-shigar wa al-shigar an yuzawwaj al-rajulu ibnatahu ala an yuzawwijahu al-akhara ibnatahu wa laysa baynahuma sadaq. And so ibn Umar radiyallahu ta'ala anhuma relates from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he naha, he prohibited. He prohibited, told us you cannot do this and what he prohibited is referred to as nikah al-shigar. Nikah al-shigar was then, was then explained and a definition was given to it. And here it's very important that we understand this and we're going to talk about where this definition even comes from. Because this is mudraj. Meaning it's added on to the, to the hadith, but it's not from Kalam al Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa did not say this. And so the definition that was given, we're going to talk about who gave this definition, is that nikah al shigar, the marriage that is referred to as shigar, is the marital contract where a man marries off his daughter to another man to marry his daughter back to the first one. So there's an exchange. And lastly, وَلَيْسَ بَيْنَهُمَا صَدَاق They say there's no, there's no dowry. There is no, sadaq is another name for mahar. There's another name for mahar, we'll talk about that shortly inshallah ta'ala. The names of al-mahar. And so there's no dowry. They say, well, look, we'll just exchange without any money. Is this their right to do? Whose right is it to receive the dowry? The right of the daughters in this circumstance. So they took away... This right of these daughters, which is in essence one of the conditions that we spoke about, that is the exchange that permitted that intimacy. And so the Prophet ﷺ prohibited this. Let's look back at the hadith again and look at the terminologies that are used. Ashigar. Ashigar. Ashigar of Lugha, it comes from a rafa, which is to uplift something. And so this is the marital contract where something was uplifted and removed. Something that should have been there was taken away. What was taken away? The mahar. So that is in essence what shigar is. So what is the meaning of this hadith? The meaning of this hadith is that from the types of marriages that would occur in the pre-Islamic era, in al-Jahiliyyah, is where the guardians of the women, the men that were responsible for uh, uh, these women would take away one of their conditions for their own personal benefit, which is that they get something in return and they would ignore their right. And the Sharia came to prevent that because this is a form of zulm, uh, this is a form of oppression over these women. And that we learn other benefits as well, but we look at that from the lessons that we take away from this hadith. One of the important things that we need to quickly stop and ponder over is that definition. That the man marries off. That definition, where does it stem from? 
Shiran is a well-known term in the Arabic language. We said that its meaning is al-rafa'. But that ta'rif, where does it come from? Before we even get there, we have to understand something about this particular hadith. This particular hadith, it has a very well-known silsila, a very well-known chain that we sometimes refer to in the science of hadith as a silsila al dhahabiyya It's the golden chain of narration. It is the best chain of narration, and it's very important that we are aware of this. And this is the chain of narration that is sometimes seen in the Muatta Imam Malik, that is referred to as the Thulathiyat of Imam Malik. So between Imam Malik and the Prophet Sallallahu there's just three people. So Malik, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, he basically says, An Nafi'. I heard Nafi'a say, Ad Ibn Umar, that Ibn Umar heard, Al Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So you have that chain of narration. This is the, 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 the best form of narration that you get in the most authentic. And so there is no dispute amongst the scholars of Islam that whoever made this definition is where? Is one of these three. So it, it's not the Messenger of Allah, وسلم, as we know. The scholars of Islam specifically say that. The norm of Imam Malik, if he brings a definition, that he says, Qultu. So he'll say, I said in his Muatta, and he'll, he'll make it quite clear that something that that is, he attaches onto the hadith is from his statements and not from the narration itself. So we know that Imam Malik ta'ala, is also excluded from this. Who remains? It's either a tabi'i, which is nafi', or the companion, which is Ibn Umar, and the majority are upon the, the they believe that this is that this definition is a definition of nafi'. That nafi' basically explained what the circumstances of a shirar that led to its prohibition was during the pre-Islamic era, where there was this exchange and the uplifting of the dowry. Whatever the definition, or whatever the case might be, Qurtubi rahimahullah ta'ala says, Tafsir al-Shirari sahihun, muwafiqun lima dhakarahu ahlul lughati. That the definition that was given for a shirar in this hadith is authentic because it literally matches the Arabic language and its linguistic usage, which is the uplifting of this condition of the dowry. And so, what is the ruling of a shirar? A shirar is prohibited. It's haram. That the scholars of Islam have no dispute regarding. The second point as well, which is hal yaqtadil fasad, that if there was a marital contract of this nature, would it lead lead to its invalidity? Meaning that such a marital contract is invalid, and that is also the correct opinion. What is the reasoning, the illa? Why is it prohibited? Why, is it, why does it become invalid? Is it because of the fact that the sadaq was uplifted? Is it because there is an exchange that took place? What is it? And so the, the scholars of Islam, or the bulk of them, they hold that, no, the prohibition is attached to the majority. They hold that the prohibition is attached to the uplifting of the condition of al-mahar and not to do with this topic of exchange. It should also be very important that we point out as well that others from the scholars of Islam do have other views on this. And so Imam Ahmad ta'ala, in one of the narrations from him, which is not the madhab, it is not the official position of the Hanbalis, but it is a narration from Imam Ahmad ta'ala, is that he said even if there is an exchange, the fact that you know you're, there's an exchange here, your daughter for mine, even if a, a sadaq is given, a mahar, a dowry is given, then that nikah would still be invalid. And there is a discussion regarding this, but the correct opinion is that that's not really a condition. We're going to get to this topic of the volition, the free will, the fact that the women need to voice her marriage and show that she is happy with this and how that takes place from a shari perspective inshallah ta'ala in a hadith to come but that is not the stronger opinion here um, for a much more detailed discussion the shaykh ibn baz rahimahullah ta'ala has a risala on, on alanki al batil which is very important to refer back to which are the types of marriages that are prohibited and some uh, definitions and examples of that in the modern day and age rahimahullah ta'ala so that's a very uh, piece a good piece of work to go to go back to regarding uh, this topic. Um, we're going to move on to the following hadith, which is another example of a removal of a condition or the placing, more, to be more specific, the placing of a condition that led to uh, uh, the invalidity of the marital contract and its prohibition. And Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an, anna nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam anaha an nikahil mut'ati yawma khaybar. 
وعلى وعلى لحوم الحمر الأهلية. And so in this hadith of Ali ibn Abi Talib رضي الله عنه, he said that he heard the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم prohibiting نها that he prohibited the nikah known as nikah al mutati nikah al muta yom khaybar on the day of khaybar meaning after the battle of khaybar after the battle of khaybar which is a famous conquest that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam made towards the direction of khaybar which is not too far from medina during the 5th or the 6th year of hijrah and so and one of the things that occurred as always the prohibition of al hum al humr al ahliya which we won't go into uh, uh, today so in this hadith we find the prohibition the prohibition in nahi prohibition of nikah al muta what is nikah al muta what is nikah al muta nikah al muta is a marital contract where there is a expiry date attached to it so you say there's a condition that after a month or two or six months or a year or two, we're going to separate. And this marital contract, once we reach the ajal, the end point, this marital contract is then dissolved and annulled. It's no longer fit for purpose. It expires with reaching the end of that time frame. And so this is what nikah al muta is. Uh, this is what nikah al muta. Uh, is what happens and so uh, before we move on inshallah ta'ala this is a very important point to just jot down really uh, quickly which is you have two scenarios that kind of relate to this the first is where there is a stipulated time frame so ishtiratu shartin ila ajalin where you stipulate a condition that this marital contract ends at a certain time frame. And the second scenario is when that is not a condition, but the, for example, the, bro, the groom in this sense, the man, he has, the, he has in his heart that after a year or two or whatever, he's going to separate from this woman. And this is something that the early generations of Muslims spoke about. Ibn Daqiq al Eid, rahimahullah, he says, وَفُقَهَاءُ الْأَمْصَارِ كُلِّهِمْ عَلَى الْمَنْعَ That the scholars of Islam and the jurists, the Muslim jurists of all of the lands are upon the prohibition of nikah al Now, what is it that they actually prohibit? And this is the question. So we have these two scenarios. One is to verbalize an end date. And the second is when the individual has in his heart that after a certain time frame we're going to split but he doesn't make the bride aware of this. This is something that just is in his heart that he's not going to remain with her for that long. So he says rahimahullah ta'ala wa akthar al-fuqaha'i 'ala al-iqtisar fi at-tahrim 'ala al-'aqd al-mu'akkad. The the majority of the scholars of Islam, the fuqaha, the Muslim jurists, they believe that this Tahreem, this prohibition is connected to the verbalizing of and stipulating an end point in the contract itself by saying we're going to get married up until that date and then after that date we're no longer married. As for if the, he is to believe this in his heart, then the scholars of Islam have a famous uh, discussion regarding this, which is the khilaf regarding the individual that um, has the intention to divorce at a certain time frame without obviously the other person knowing and being aware of it and as a result of that he doesn't make that a condition which we'll get to and so nikah al muta is prohibited and it is invalid it invalidates the marital contract because of the stipulation of uh, this condition it was permissible in the early stages of al islam and the scholars of al islam differ over when it was permitted, and there are two time frames that were uh, some of the hadith come regarding when it was uh, when the nasq, the abrogation of this ruling came about. And so, here in this hadith, Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu mentioned Yawm Khaybar, the battle of Khaybar, as for other hadith that they mention a, late, uh, a later date, which was uh, Fath Makkah, the opening of Mecca. 
This marital contract, regardless of why it was made permissible for certain time frames and for certain reasons, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited it because of the many harms that come about within society as a result of practicing this. And the biggest of them is اختلاط الأنساب Because the marital contract is supposed to be a relationship between a man and a woman that goes on and on that becomes the formation of uh, uh, one of the cornerstones of the Muslim society which is what? Which is the family. And that you as a result of that look after your family and raise them properly and the mother deals with the work that needs to be done within the home. And as a result of that we grow a moral society that it contains moral individuals and a home where everybody's attached together and this cycle continues up until the end of that marriage, whether it's by way of divorce or by way of them passing away. That is how marriage is supposed to function in Al Islam. Not that it's for a temporary pleasure enjoyment, which then ends and then the individual moves to another one. And then you have all of these different children from different marriages, because that is a very harmful process that you can see in some countries today. And what that leads to where people don't even know who their parents are and so on. Um, I will ignore this mas'ala of the individual that intends to get married for a certain time frame because of time restrictions. But remember, that issue is a tissue of differing amongst the scholars of Islam, even though some of the scholars of Islam pushed it into the categories of Al-Mut'ah. And so from those views are that it is uh, uh, Imam Al-Awza'i, for example, and certain individuals such as uh, from the Hanabila Qadi Abi A'la, and several of his uh, companions, they all held the view that this falls into a form of muta. This is a form of the sort of like a temporary enjoyment because whatever the case is, it still ends with the same result, which is that after a certain point in time, that this marriage is no longer functioning because this individual wants to move away because in his perception, marriage is only a temporary pleasure and enjoyment and he just walks away from that. But some of those scholars even argue it's even worse than the muta itself because, because of the fact that there is a level of deceit towards the woman in the sense where the first one actually she knew what she was getting herself into. In this scenario, she agrees to a marriage and suddenly she finds out that the man just wants to split after a certain time period and that is even worse because this wasn't something that she wanted. She wanted the continuity of that marriage and so there is a level of khida and so on, deception on behalf of the man towards uh, the woman. And we'll stop here inshaAllah ta'ala and move on to the rest of the conditions uh, after Salat al-Isha.